Generalized anxiety disorder is characterized by persistent and uncontrollable worrying that causes functional impairment. This functional impairment and distress can affect your relationships with your friends and family, can even affect your work, and for it to classify as a disorder has to last for more than six months. People with generalized anxiety disorder can feel physical symptoms like muscle tension and fatigue. So in this video, we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna talk about how common it is, what the thinking is around the causes of generalized anxiety disorder. We're gonna also talk about the prognosis and the course of the illness, how long to expect it to last for. We're talking about this today so that when you do talk to your doctor, maybe it's for diagnostic clarity, maybe it's for advice around the management of your illness or your friend's illness. But when you talk to them, you will be more empowered and better educated on what to talk about. If you're new here, my name is Dr. Sill. I'm a junior doctor from Sydney, Australia, working in mental health. And in my free time, when I do get some, I love making YouTube videos to help educate and empower people. And if you want to support the channel, please leave this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and think about sharing it with other people who might benefit from it. Okay, let's begin. So let's talk about the epidemiology of generalized anxiety disorder. So how many people it affects? Well, the reason I'm making this video is because guess what? It affects a lot of people. It's the most prevalent mental illness in the world. So different epidemiological papers will spit out slightly different rates of generalized anxiety disorder. But if you look at these three papers, it looks like on average, there's about a five to 10% lifetime prevalence of generalized anxiety disorder. That means that if you get a hundred people, five to 10 of them will have generalized anxiety disorder at some point in their life. That's pretty high. And if you look at those who do get generalized anxiety disorder, females are twice as likely to get it as males. Now in the world of mental illness, it's pretty unfortunately common that multiple diagnoses are the rule rather than the exception. So when you have someone who's suffering from generalized anxiety disorder, they can often have other disorders. So in terms of the most common mental illnesses associated with generalized anxiety disorder, you have depression, substance use disorders, and of course, other anxiety disorders, things like PTSD, social phobia, or other general phobias. Okay, let's talk a bit about the cause and thinking around the cause of generalized anxiety disorder. Now in all psychiatry, whenever we talk about cause, we always think biopsychosocial model. Okay, that means we consider the biological factors, which are things like genetics and you know physical illnesses that might trigger an illness. And then you need to think about the psychosocial factors, the things like your upbringing and the way that you form attachments and relationships. So in terms of genetics, there does seem to be evidence for genetic inheritance that increases the risk of developing generalized anxiety disorder. And some genes have even been identified. So variations in the subtype of the gene glutamic acid decarboxylase is associated with an increased susceptibility to, to developing generalized anxiety disorder. And this study also found that if you had increased expression of a serotonin transporter gene linked polymorphic region genotype, then that also increased your risk of developing generalized anxiety disorder. Now, I know you guys are gonna ask, what about neurotransmitters? What about serotonin? And yes, I'm aware of that Moncrief paper earlier in the year that disputed the mechanism of action around serotonin and serotonergic drugs affecting depression really and anxiety disorders. We won't go into that right now. I will make a video about the management of anxiety disorders and the medicines and we can talk about it then. But for now, all I'll say is this. It's really hard to test what's happening in the synapses between neurons because you can't really go into people's brains to look at what's happening with the neurotransmitters in the kind of synaptic junctions. And investigations into the role of neurotransmitters and other different biomarkers for generalized anxiety disorders have been inconsistent. So the short answer with neurotransmitters is that we don't yet know. We have to stay humble. The brain's very hard organ to understand. It's the last biological frontier. So. I'm not gonna make a formal comment. It's very likely that there's some new serotonergic or dopaminergic abnormality that that affects the pathways in the brain and their threshold to being activated, like the fight and flight response. Maybe we'll find out about that one day. So for example, what's been found is if you put people into an MRI, some people with generalized 
anxiety disorder, some people without, and you show them different images, you can see that in people who have generalized anxiety disorder, their apprehension, their expectation, they, they trigger the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that triggers the fight flight response, basically, which is kind of like the anxiety response that triggers even on neutral photos, things that shouldn't trigger it, they anticipate more and are more apprehensive. And so it's triggered easier. So if you have generalized anxiety disorder, it's kind of like the threshold to the fight and flight response, which is a normal response, by the way, which everyone gets. It's just a lower threshold to it being activated and also has, you have that ongoing apprehension baseline and variations in glucose metabolism and other important areas of the brain, such as the limbic system. You know, we won't get into all that right now, but I guess now it's a good time to talk about the psychosocial triggers and causes for generalized anxiety disorder. So psychologically, if you present to people ambivalent material, you know, 100 people without generalized anxiety disorder, 100 people with generalized anxiety disorder, the group with generalized anxiety disorder will have a more negative interpretation of that material. But the interesting thing is these biases and the hypervigilance associated with these biases is actually can be reversed with cognitive behavioral therapy, one of the key parts of treatment for generalized anxiety disorder. Now, in terms of development and childhood, people with generalized anxiety do tend to have an increased risk of experiencing childhood adverse events. And in terms of personality factors, people who are more shy, which the scientific term is behavioral inhibition, and people who have higher neuroticism actually have an increased risk of generalized anxiety disorder. And that kind of makes sense, right? You're shy probably because you're worried about what people think about you, which is a kind of neurotic trait. And, and if you're neurotic, you're, you're, you're you know, very vigilant. You're very worried about things that probably shouldn't worry you too much. And so that can lead to excessive worry, which can lead to generalized anxiety disorder if it lasts for six months and causes functional decline. All right, I think that does it for talking about the science about what causes generalized anxiety disorder. We should now move on about what you should do when you see the doctor for the first time, or even if you've seen them before, things that they should know about you. So the key thing the doctor needs to know, how long have you been worrying for and what are you worrying about? So is it one thing in particular? Is it just spiders? Because guess what? That's a phobia, not a generalized anxiety disorder. Or is it general? Is it your health, your finances, your work, your family, your friends? Is it multiple things causing rumination so you can't sleep, you can't get to work, you skipped days at work, things like that. Those things they need to know because if it's lots of things that makes it generalized. And that's a different management, for example, to a phobia, which has a totally different approach to management. Now, in terms of the onset, it's important to try and remember when did it really start for you. And the average age of onset is actually later than most people think. It's actually age 30. So you can have pretty chilled teenagehood, maybe a bit neurotic in personality. And then really by age 30, when work starts kicking off and kids start kicking off, it gets a bit overwhelming and it starts causing functional impact and you develop an anxiety disorder. Now, some studies have suggested that age of onset can predict the severity of the illness. Those haven't been replicated, so don't stress about that. It's pretty unclear if there's any relationship between age of onset and severity of illness. Now, in terms of the course and chronicity of the symptoms, it's important to remember that this is a remitting, relapsing, or I guess fluctuating course of illness. The symptoms change in severity over the year. So if you're going through a really bad kind of phase can be reassured that it's not going to last forever. So in one prospective study of 179 individuals with generalized anxiety disorder, approximately 60% of patients recovered over 12 years. So what I mean by recovered is they didn't have any residual symptoms for eight consecutive weeks, but approximately one half of those who did recover, so they were symptom free, did have a relapse during the 12 year period. So more than half of people can recover from anxiety disorders, but of the people that do recover, they might have another relapse period, but then they will recover again. So it's that kind of course we're talking about. One predictor for the course of illness and the outcome is that if you have not needed to go into hospital and you're in the community, you tend to have a better prognosis of the illness. And that makes sense because the severity isn't so bad that you need hospitalization. That being said, that doesn't mean you should avoid going to hospital if you need to go to hospital, because if it's that serious that you need to go to hospital, you should bloody go to hospital.
Other things that can predict a longer or more severe course of illness is comorbidities, so other mental illnesses. So if there's substance use, because you know people try and reduce their anxiety by drinking or smoking a bit of pot or whatever, those things increase the, the kind of severity of the illness because they give temporary relief and then you get a rebound severe anxiety. You also need to tell your doctor about your general health status and if you have any physical comorbidities because having an anxiety disorder does increase your risk of poor cardiovascular health and heart disease as well as high blood pressure. But look, it's just also important for you to do your best to have good sleep, a healthy diet and a bit of exercise as well. So based on your discussion with the doctor, maybe you will get a diagnosis of an anxiety disorder. But there are a lot of different anxiety disorders and often anxiety can be a symptom of a another mental illness and it's not generalized anxiety disorder so you can have anxiety with other mental illnesses like if someone has schizophrenia and they have they're hearing voices and are really concerned that's going to make them anxious okay that's not generalized anxiety disorder that treating the, the anxiety is not going to fix the mental illness they're experiencing so that's why it's really important that you see a doctor and get diagnosis from a qualified doctor you cannot get a diagnosis off of youtube you know this is not a diagnostic video this is just to educate and empower you so that being said let's talk about some of the common other diagnoses that you see with generalized anxiety disorder or instead of so people think they have generalized anxiety disorder but it's actually one of these so the first one is agitated depression so people with persistent depressive disorder characterize instead of the slowing and the melancholic depression it's actually like an agitated depression and so differentiating these two things is pretty tricky. It needs a doctor's evaluation discussion with you, but you need to find out whether the patient is self-critical, because if you're depressed, you're usually unable to enjoy anything, and you're usually very self-critical with, with a sense of guilt. Whereas with anxiety disorders, you can still enjoy things from time to time, and usually worried about future anticipatory events, rather than depression, which is it's hard to see into the future with a depression. Another common illness you'll see is illness anxiety disorder, which is kind of like generalized anxiety disorder but instead of it being generalized it's about your physical symptoms and the, and the, the experience you're having within so if you feel like a bit of a pain in the chest you might think you're having a heart attack and you go to the emergency department and then it's characterized by frequent visits to the emergency department because you're just really worried that something serious is going on but the key thing in illness anxiety disorder is that you've had all the tests and it hasn't shown that there's anything at least that the tests can pick up another really common one that I see is panic disorder so people who aren't just anxious about everything generally, but anxious about getting a panic attack. And it's to the point that they are doing maladaptive behaviors to avoid the panic attack. So for example, if they're worried about getting a panic attack in a social environment, you know, at a party or at work, then they will avoid going to work even if it means they get in trouble with their boss or even if it means they get fired. That's maladaptive. Remember, these can happen with generalized anxiety disorder or instead of generalized anxiety disorder and that's why you need to see a doctor. You also see obsessive compulsive disorder where people are anxious and usually it looks generalized because it's about multiple things. Do the proper investigation, like the appropriate history, you will find that there's actually obsessions and compulsions. And we'll talk about OCD in another video, but that requires a doctor to kind of talk through. And finally, you could have non-pathological anxiety, right? I don't know if I've made a good point of this yet, but it's really important to remember that anxiety is a normal human emotion and process and it's beneficial you want to have stress and anxiety that can save your life but you want it to not be pathological you want it only when you need it you know when you see the lion you can have the fight or flight response or if you're being attacked you need to be able to run away whereas if you're getting it because you're worried that i don't know there'll be no hot water tomorrow and you're incapacitated by that that's a problem so assessing the functional impact of the disorder on you it needs to be done by a doctor and that can help with diagnostic clarification. All right, good stuff, guys. We talked about the epidemiology, the manifestations, the course of the illness, and what you need to tell your doctor about generalized anxiety disorder. I hope that was a helpful video. I think the next video will be about the treatment options that you can explore with your doctor. This is kind of the education about what it is and, and what to talk about. And the next video will be like, if you get the right diagnosis, if you're diagnosed by a doctor with generalized anxiety disorder, what are the options for you and you can negotiate with your doctor what you need if you enjoyed the video please remember to leave it a like and subscribe to the channel share it with someone you think might benefit from it and join me on this wonderful youtube journey and i'll see you in the next video all right bye for now